Good morning. I'm going to start by telling you something that's difficult for me to say, and that's that <clears throat> I'm embarrassed to admit that I have a career. I, I, if somebody asks me what it is that I do for a living, I, I, I change the subject. But I do have a career, and here's the evidence. Uh, I have uh, been going to work, doing the same kind of work, five days a week, often on weekends, for almost 30 years. I get paid for this. I've written, uh, based on my work, 250 uh, journal articles and three uh, textbooks. I've supervised the PhD theses of dozens of students, and I've introduced hundreds of undergraduates to research and engineering. I've given invited talks all over the world, and uh, I'm often surprised that people show up, and, uh, and I'm always surprised that they pay attention, uh, which you seem to be so far. Uh, so, uh, so I think I work hard, I'm competent, so what's the source of this lingering embarrassment? Well, to get to it, I'll first tell you a little bit about what I do. I, uh, I study how drugs move around in the body, and I try to invent ways to make them better, to make them last longer, or be safer, or uh, be more effective. And to tell you why this is important, I'm going to give you an example that you already know about. If you have a headache and you take an aspirin, then you swallow the pill and the molecules of, of aspirin get absorbed into your blood. The concentration in your body uh, rises, hopefully rises above some point where you begin to see uh, an effect, and that effect lasts for some period of time. For most drugs, that's several hours. And then uh, your body gets rid of those molecules by a variety of mechanisms, concentration falls, and the drug goes away. If you still have a headache, then you might take another pill, and the pattern repeats itself. That's fine for taking aspirin, but for many drugs, perhaps drugs that are less safe than aspirin, if you take the pills too close together, you take too many of them, then the concentration might rise to a level that causes you side effects. And if you don't take them frequently enough, or you don't take enough of them, then the concentration might fall below the level where you get an effect. And so in many cases, there's a, a value for finding better ways to deliver uh, drugs. I'm going to start with three examples from the work that I've done over this past uh, uh, 30 years. The first is from the 1990s, when I worked with a team of engineers and uh, neurosurgeons to develop a better method for treating brain tumors. And brain tumors are notoriously difficult to treat, and particularly difficult to treat with chemotherapy, because even if you get large quantities of chemotherapy into the bloodstream, very little of it goes to the brain because of the blood-brain barrier. So we took a different approach. We took chemotherapy molecules, and we embedded them in a dissolvable polymer wafer. And that wafer was engineered so that it slowly released these molecules over time. And then we gave these wafers to surgeons to use as a tool during surgery to remove a tumor. They can't always remove it all. In fact, they frequently can't remove it all. So they replace the tumor with these wafers, which then release chemotherapy locally at the site. This was approved by the FDA in 1996. It's manufactured under the trade name Gliadel, and it's extended the life for thousands of, uh, of patients uh, who, uh, who had brain tumors. Another example. Uh, with my uh, students, we designed vaginal rings that could slowly release antibodies. And we picked antibodies that we knew were capable of neutralizing viruses that cause sexually transmitted diseases, viruses like herpes and HIV. And we designed the ring so that it would release those antibodies over a period of many weeks. And if this ring is in place, then the antibodies are released and the reproductive tract is protected from, uh, from uh, infection by even um, large quantities of uh, virus. The third example is a more recent one. And uh, here we've taken the technology and we've shrunk it down so we can make tiny nanoparticles, again, of dissolvable polymers. But, uh, but these are so small that they're much, much smaller than a cell. They can still slowly release whatever we put inside them. But they can enter cells uh, without, safely without uh, causing any effect. And then they release their agent inside, say it's an anti-infective agent, and it will protect that cell from infection for the duration of time that the particle is releasing. I think that this technology is going to change the way that we give medicines. 
It's going to have remarkable effects in lots of different uh, diseases. And I'm going to get back to that point a little bit later. But first, I'm going to tell you a story about my father. My father was 21 when I was born. I'm the first of his five children. <clears throat> During the period of my youth, he worked for an insurance company. And uh, he, was, uh, uh, he worked for an insurance company. And uh, the period I'm thinking about, I was 8 to 10 years old. And I haunted the house in the early evenings during that period. I was waiting for my father to get home. My father was a neatly dressed man, but at the end of the day, his tie would be loosened slightly. And he had a habit of carrying his suit coat hooked over a finger and draped over his shoulder. So it looked to me like he was wearing a cape. I would wait for him at the end of the day, and I would listen for his car to arrive in the driveway, and I would time my arrival to the kitchen to the same time that he was coming in the back door uh, from, uh, from the driveway. And when he saw me in the kitchen, he would always say the same thing. Hey, bud, it's time for a little toddy. My father liked his martinis dry and on the rocks, and he was very particular about their preparation. He taught me how many uh, ice cubes to add to his favorite glass. He taught me how to measure out the right quantity of vermouth by, met, by, by pouring it into the bottle cap and then onto the ice. Vermouth was challenging. It took practice and patience on my part. Uh, but vodka was easy. It followed the vermouth in a deep wave. I, I, I remember a lot of sensations about this practice, the feel of a swizzle stick moving through icy liquid, the gurgling of the liquid, the clanking of the ice cubes against the glass, uh, the smell of olives when you open the jar, and the challenge of trying to spear those olives floating in their brine with a plastic sword so that I could move them into the glass. I uh, made my father his martini, and I would carry it in my, uh, in my two hands into the living room where he was now sitting in his favorite chair uh, with a copy of the Des Moines Tribune on his lap. And I would hand it to him, and he would take it from me with his one, uh, with his one large hand. And he would say to me, oh, bud, that's my boy. And uh, I would linger for a few minutes while he read the paper and, and enjoyed his, uh, his beverage. And then I would get bored, and I would slip away to play uh, with my sister or to watch uh, television. Uh, the particular night that I'm thinking about, again, I was 8 to 10 years old, and I, uh, about an hour after dinner, I found my father in the uh, family room. He was lying face down on the floor, and his breathing was rhythmic, and I could see that. And so I, 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 I crawled onto his back, and I pushed my thin, I was thin then, I pushed my thin body against his and I rode on his, just laid against him and rode on his back, and it felt like I was a canoe riding a peaceful sea. Um, after a few moments, he rolled over and he wrapped his arm around me and managed to pull me in front of him and, and held me in an embrace. And that lasted a few minutes, and then he began to tickle me uh, because he wanted me to laugh, uh, which parents do. And, uh, and uh, I did laugh, and then he continued uh, tickling, and I laughed more, and his, his tickling became more aggressive, and my laughter turned to sobs, and my eyes started to water, and I couldn't stand it anymore, and so I had to break away and run to my uh, room. Uh, and I closed the door, but not, but not early enough uh, that I didn't uh, hear him say to my mother, Joyce, he's crying again. He's such a baby. The atmosphere of my life has always involved alcohol or been surrounded by alcohol. If I see a can of Budweiser, I think about family reunions from the 1960s. My sister and I would take the pop tops off the cans and we'd link them into a chain and wear them around our neck. In 1974, my friends Kirk and Dale and I laid in a, in a cold field in January in Iowa taking long gulps of cherry-flavored vodka from a bottle, because that was how young men became friends in Iowa. <laughs> I went to college and graduate school, and I learned 
about the chemistry of alcohol or ethanol, how it's absorbed in the duodenum, it circulates in the blood, it quickly passes through the blood-brain barrier entering the brain, and uh, then is converted eventually into acetylaldehyde, which is excreted in the, in the bile or in the urine. I began to specialize in my studies, and my specialization was the duration of action of drugs. For alcohol, the duration of action after a single drink is about two hours, but it's more complicated than that. Some uh, colleagues of mine at the University of Michigan uh, wrote and solved a wad of mathematical equations, and using these equations, they can describe the fate of every molecule of alcohol that enters when a 70-kilogram male uh, has a drink. The half-life, as I mentioned, of alcohol is about uh, two hours, and it follows a process of exponential decay, which is the way that many uh, drugs are uh, eliminated from the body. Uh, about 15 years ago, I began to have this fantasy. Uh, so this was long after I'd made the martinis for my father, but I had this fantasy that some of those molecules must still be inside him. And then if I looked in his eyes, I could see him, see those molecules in him, and that they must be still there, connecting me to him and guiding his behavior, the things that he did or didn't do. Now, that notion might make faint sense to you, uh, but it made some sense to me because I understood this process of exponential decay and how slow it can be. And I first learned about exponential decay from my high school physics teacher, Mr. Dreyfus. Uh, Mr. Dreyfus posed a problem to the class. He said, stand up from the seat that you're sitting in, and if you can walk to the door of the classroom and you get halfway there with each step, how long will it take you to arrive at the door? And if you answer too quickly like some of my classmates did, you'll say two steps. But the answer is you never get to the doorway. Every step gets you half of the distance. So you continue to get closer, but you never, ever arrive. And that's a process of exponential decay. In my uh, class at Yale this semester, the students did an experiment where they all stood up, and each one of them had a coin, and on a cue from me, they flipped their coin, and if it landed tails, they had to sit down. If they landed heads, they stayed up for the next flip. And this process of students sitting down follows a process of exponential decay with a half-life of one flip. But what we learned is that it takes a much longer time than you think for all the students to sit down, even though half of them are sitting down with each flip. So I understood this process of exponential decay, and that was my rationale for thinking that it would take a long time. A drink contains a lot of molecules. It would take a long time for all those molecules to leave my uh, father. Well, the error of that logic is pretty simple to demonstrate. Uh, if you take the number of ethanol molecules in a hefty martini, uh, that's uh, 7 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. That's a lot of molecules. And now you imagine you take away half of those every two hours, every two, every two hours uh, for a period. After a day, uh, 20 or 2 times 10 to the 20th molecules remain. After uh, about three days, 700 billion molecules remain. That's still an awful lot. But after six and a half days, only one uh, lonely uh, molecule remains. So while process of, of exponential decay can be slow to complete, they're relentless and they eventually get very close to completion. None of the molecules I made for my father are likely uh, still within him. They followed the unemotional laws of chemistry and physics, disappearing by halves over the uh, period since we, since we shared that experience. But the longing that I have for my father continues, and it doesn't diminish. It, it doesn't follow that same process. I feel like I'm still the boy that made martinis for my father, but I realize I'm also the man who's made delivery systems for chemotherapy and other, uh, and other useful, uh, 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 delivery of other useful drugs. Here at Yale, we're working on a project with an with a amazing team of people, and we think that we uh, can find a cure for cystic fibrosis. It involves those nanoparticles I talked about earlier. And in this case, we load those nanoparticles with fragments of genes. And if these nanoparticles enter a cell, they slowly release these gene fragments, which find their way into the chromosome of the cell. And they can repair 
the mutation in cystic fibrosis and replace it with the correct sequence. We've already tested this idea in mice. Mice can inhale these particles, which reach the cells of their lung, and they can convert the cells from cystic fibrosis cells to more uh, normal cells. They begin to function like normal cells. Uh, I think there's tremendous promise with this technology in other areas as well. We can use the same kind of approach to make blood cells resistant to the HIV uh, virus. To bring these to reality, it's going to take people that understand how to slowly release molecules in the body and how to target them to the right site. It's going to take people that are experts in what I now know. We live in a world that that really reeks of alcohol and bathes in its consequences. A lost father, for me, was one of those uh, consequences. Uh, and one thing I've learned is that, for me, uh, the shame is a very powerful force. It can make us embarrassed, even embarrassed at our own success. And so the footnote, for me, is this. Although I've felt at times that I was swimming in shame, I think that that same force has propelled me to something that's good, to something that's useful, to something that I'm proud to be a part of. Thank you.